Hi, my name is George Braswell, and this is topic eight for CYB 650, Organization Security Policy and the Executive Summary. To start, we have the Executive Summary. Uh, this report that we're going to go through, uh, this presentation covers various aspects related to cybersecurity standards and policies in an organization. Um, there are a couple of different organizations in this presentation uh, that will be covered. It explains the process for creating and changing different types of standards and discusses the NIST cybersecurity framework uh, as it applies to one of the organizations. And it also outlines the cybersecurity lifecycle methodologies and frameworks used to establish a cybersecurity program uh, that would uh, support the organization's strategic objectives. Furthermore, this report explains the importance of an organization's security policy and how it supports its business objectives. Uh, it includes a system and network diagram from, of the organization uh, to help understand IT infrastructure. This report also covers risk assessment, business impact analysis, and business continuity plans of the organization. Uh, those are very important for identifying mitigating potential cybersecurity threats. Additionally, this report compares and contrasts different types of standards, including laws, regulations, policies, voluntary, uh, and framework-based standard, standards, and finally wraps up with the incident response and handling plan. So to jump into it, processes for the creation and or changes to different types of standards. The creation and changes to different types of cybersecurity standards typically involve the following processes as seen here on the screen. Uh, research and, and analysis, standard development, review and feedback, revision and finalization, publication and adoption, and finally maintenance. First step is to conduct research and analysis to identify a specific area that needs to be addressed within the cybersecurity standard. Um, and then into standard development. Once that research and analysis uh, are complete, the standard development process can begin, which involves drafting standard language, defining the scope of the standard, and outlining the technical specifications. Uh, for review and feedback, after the standard is drafted, it is typically subjected to a review process, which could involve soliciting feedback from stakeholders, um, which would also include industry experts, government agencies, or other interested parties, depending on um, who those stakeholders might be for that organization. Next, revision and finalization. Based on the feedback received, the standard can be revised and then finalized after that. Um, this could include several rounds of revision and feedback before the final uh, standard is, is ready to go. Uh, once the standard is finalized, it's typically published and made available to the public. Organizations may choose to adopt the standard voluntarily, or it could be required to do so by regulatory bodies. Uh, the final step is maintenance. The standard has to be maintained and updated over time to re reflect changes in technology, best practices, and new and evolving threats. Framework alignment for the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. Uh, <clears throat> this involves the NOOC incorporated organization. Um, and so aligning NOOC to the NIST cybersecurity framework involves several steps. First, understanding the framework, um, reviewing the CSF and its five core functions, which are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover to understand the objectives and requirements of the framework. Next would be assessing the current cybersecurity posture. This would uh, involve using the CSF to assess Nook's current cybersecurity posture, including the strengths and weaknesses of the current practices, uh, identifying gaps, comparing the current cybersecurity posture to the CSF's objectives and requirements to identify any gaps in Nook Incorporated cybersecurity program, uh, developing a plan, developing a plan to address identified gaps and then align the organization's cybersecurity program with the CSF. Uh, up next, implementation and management, uh, implementing the plan, managing Nook cybersecurity program. This would also involve some continuous monitoring as well uh, to make sure that that is maintained. And then finally, continuous improvement. Uh, this involves continuously assessing and improving the cybersecurity program to meet the ever-evolving threat landscape. Uh, this table here is, follows the five core functions of the CSF and the different uh, parts of Nook Incorporated's business uh, that each would fall uh, under the certain core aspects of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Next slide, cybersecurity lifecycle framework and methodologies. 
the cybersecurity lifecycle is a continuous process of identifying, protecting, detecting, responding, and recovering from cybersecurity threats. Uh, it involves assessing risks, implementing controls, monitoring systems, and responding to incidents. The cycle is ongoing and requires regular updates and maintenance to stay effective. The cybersecurity framework, as we've discussed previously, is a set of guidelines and best practices for managing cybersecurity risks. It provides a structured approach for organizations to identify, assess, and manage cybersecurity risks. The NIST cybersecurity framework, referenced in the previous two slides, is a very popular example of such a framework. There are several others, of course. To establish a cybersecurity program that supports the organization's strategic initiatives, a methodology should be used that takes into account the unique risks and challenges of the business. And this could involve conducting a comprehensive risk assessment, developing policies and procedures that address specific risks and challenges of the organization, implementing technical controls, training employees and stakeholders on the importance of cybersecurity, uh, regular monitoring and testing of systems, and establishing a response plan to address cybersecurity incidents. Security policy supporting business objectives. Um, I have five points here on this. An organizational security policy is a set of rules, guidelines, and procedures that an organization establishes to protect its assets from security threats. An effective security policy can support business objectives in these five ways here. The first being protecting confidential information. An organizational security policy helps protect confidential information such as trade secrets, customer data, and financial information. Up next, meeting regulatory requirements. Many industries are subject to regulatory requirements for data privacy and security. An organizational security policy helps ensure that the organization meets these requirements and avoids potential fines and legal liabilities. Number three, reducing security risks. An organizational security policy helps reduce security risks by establishing controls and procedures to prevent and respond to security incidents. Number four, en enhancing uh, customer trust. Customers expect organizations to protect their personal and financial information. By establishing an effective security policy, an organization can enhance customer trust and loyalty, leading to increased revenue and business growth. And finally, step five, supporting business operations. An organizational security policy helps ensure that business operations are not disrupted by security incidents. This slide represents the network diagram for Nook Incorporated, uh, featuring their secure access service edge. Um, and the uh, diagram here also highlights the zero trust network access and shows that process a little bit, which is also part of the SASE of Nook Incorporated. Next slide, risk assessment, business impact, and business continuity. This will continue for the next three slides. A first risk assessment to identify critical systems. It's crucial to understand the business processes that depend on them and the potential consequences of their failure. Uh, so these are the following steps that were taken now shifting gears over to Stark Industries um, that Stark used to identify critical systems. Uh, there are four, four steps here. Identify business critical processes. So up first, identify the key business processes that rely on the IT systems and evaluate the potential impact of the system failure on those processes. For Stark, this included the ongoing development research into future weapon platforms being conducted by the R&D department. Number two, evaluate system dependencies. Identify the systems that are dependent on other systems and determine which systems are critical for the functioning of other systems. Numerous interconnected systems were identified within the R&D department, including virtual develop environments or VDEs and virtual labs running on servers within the data center, engineering workstations, and a lab of air-gapped workstations networked for system test functions. Number three, evaluate system availability requirements. Identify the systems that have high availability requirements, such as systems that need to be available 24-7, or systems that are needed to support critical business functions. And number four, analyze system data sensitivity. Identify systems that store process sensitive data, such as financial or personally identifiable information, or PII, which would require special protections and potentially a higher level of scrutiny. Over here on the far side, once the critical systems were identified, a system of ongoing monitoring and evaluation was established to ensure that the systems remain critical and that the IT systems that support those processes are sufficiently protected and monitored as well. After conducting a vulnerability scan of Stark Industries systems, several alarming vulnerabilities and threats were discovered. These included Log4j, Apache Tomcat uh, vulnerabilities, Bash remote code execution, 
and issues with SSL v2 and v3, as well as, as the discovery of a threat already inhabiting the system called bind shell backdoor. These vulnerabilities and threats could compromise the most critical assets, such as the data servers where the VDE systems are hosted and the physical machines belonging to the engineers. These risks would cause a significant impact to the company in financial terms and in public reputation and would require a great deal of time and effort to recover from. Up next, the business impact analysis. Business impact analysis, or BIA, is a process used to identify and evaluate the potential effects of a disruption to critical business operations. Um, and so it involves a uh, analysis of various functions of the business, identifying what's critical and what could happen to it if uh, to the business if a risk were, were to be realized. Um, any kind of a business disruption um, to that business. So the critical business functions for Stark Industries were identified as research and development, sales and marketing, customer support and service, finance and accounting, and IT operations and infrastructure. The recovery priorities uh, in this order are research and development, IT operations and infrastructure, customer support and service, sales and marketing, and finally finance and accounting. Potential risks to Stark Industries business operations include natural disasters, cyber attacks, power outages, and supply chain disruptions. The, the potential impact of these risks includes loss of revenue, damage to reputation, and disruption to critical business functions. And finally, the business continuity plan. A BCP is a comprehensive and structured approach that outlines the steps an organization must take to ensure the continued operation of critical business functions during and after a disruptive event, such as a natural disaster, cyber attack, et cetera. The plan includes strategies for risk assessment, emergency response, disaster recovery, and long-term business resumption. The business continuity plan or BCP for Stark Industries is designed to ensure the company can continue to operate in the event of a major disruption or disaster, includes both incident response and discovery disaster recovery plans. The plan covers all aspects of the company's operations, including critical business functions such as research and development, sales and marketing, customer support and service, finance and accounting, and IT operations and infrastructure. Strategies include regular data backups, establishing an alternate on an alternate site, maintaining emergency stock of critical components and clear communication channels. The plan will be tested biannually, reviewed and updated at least annually, and changes to business operations or IT systems will be assessed for their impact on the plan. Standards. There are several types of cybersecurity standards, including laws, regulations, policies, voluntary standards, and framework-based standards. Here's a comparison and contrast of each type. For laws and regulations, these are legal requirements that organizations must comply with. They're typically mandatory and enforced by a governing body, such as a government agency. Violating these standards can result in fines, penalties, or other legal consequences. Examples of this uh, of cybersecurity laws and regulations include the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, in the EU, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, and the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, or CISA. Policies are organizational guidelines that define the rules, processes, and procedures that employees must follow to ensure cybersecurity uh, within the organization. Policies are not legally binding, but are enforced through internal controls, audits, and monitoring. Examples of these cybersecurity policies include password policies, access control, and incident response policies as well. Voluntary standards are non-mandatory standards that organizations can choose to adopt if they believe they would be beneficial. They're typically created by industry associations or standards organizations and provide best practices for cybersecurity. Examples of these uh, cybersecurity standards include the PCI DSS and the ISO series of standards such as ISO IEC 27001. Framework-based standards are sets of guidelines, best practices, and standards that provide a comprehensive approach to cybersecurity. Frameworks are typically voluntary but are widely adopted by organizations as a way to improve their cybersecurity posture. Uh, we've already talked about one example of a cybersecurity framework in the NIST CSF. Uh, the Center for Internet Security, CIS Critical Security Controls is another one, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, or IEC 62443 standard, is another framework. Incident handling and reporting. 
Uh, Stark Industries recognizes the importance of incident handling and response in their cybersecurity program in the face of increasing cyber attacks. A uh, roadmap has been created for implementing incident response capabilities, outlining procedures and guidelines for incident handling and reporting, communication with outside authorities, subcontractors, and customers, the team structure, communication flows, the IRT services, and, and finally, the training and staffing requirements. The procedures that Stark has adopted are based on the recommendations of the NIST SP 800-61 Revision 2 Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. The first step in incident response is to identify and assess its severity using predefined criteria to classify incidents based on type, impact, and likelihood of recurrence. The IRT, or the incident response team, is then activated to contain and minimize the incident's impact following uh, followed by an investigation to determine the root cause. Measures are taken to prevent similar incidents from occurring again, such as modifying policies and procedures, altering system configurations, installing software patches, and providing further training or education for the staff. Regular testing and monitoring of systems and processes, ongoing staff education, and audits also ensure compliance, um, and that is critical for safeguarding against further incidents. A uh, comprehensive report is produced as part of this process, providing a detailed account of the incident, including its impact, the underlying cause, and the measures taken to contain and prevent a recurrence, along with recommendations for improving Stark industry security posture. Finally, the report must be customized to cater to the diverse stakeholder requirements, providing an easily understandable depiction of the incident for any uh, individual that would happen to pick up that report. So, the, regardless of technical expertise, um, a stakeholder should be able to get that report and fully understand what has happened. The incident handling team structure uh, is as follows. Team members uh, certainly possess technical, legal, and communication abilities. Technical knowledge is necessary to identify and mitigate technological issues. Legal expertise is crucial in handling any legal matters arising from the incident. Uh, provision, proficiency in communication is vital in managing the flow of information between the company, customers, and stakeholders. And finally, the IRT is structured hierarchically with a team leader responsible for coordinating the team's activities. There are some different communication flows that occur during incident handling and reporting. Effective communication is essential to ensure that the IRT can communicate with all relevant staff sections within the organization. Stark Industries has established communication channels and protocols to facilitate effective communication. And finally, the IRT communicates regularly with executive management, IT, legal, human resources, and other relevant parties during any incident. The services that the IRT provides are uh, as follows. They provide a range of critical services, including incident identification and assessment, response planning, containment and eradication, evidence collection and, pre and preservation, reporting and communication, and post-incident review and analysis. The training and staffing requirements of the IRT. The IRT requires a combination of well-trained and skilled personnel and adequate staffing. The training requirements for the IRT include technical skills, incident response procedures, communication skills, and legal and regulatory compliance. Ongoing training is necessary to keep the IRT updated on new threats and technologies. Effective communication skills are crucial for the IRT to communicate effectively with other staff members and outside authorities. IRT members must be familiar with legal and regulatory compliance requirements and data privacy and protection laws, as well as regulations that impact the organization. The established guidelines for outside communication and contractor or subcontractor communications. Stark Industries established guidelines for effective communication with outside authorities, such as law enforcement and regulatory bodies. The guidelines aim to ensure transparency and cooperation while protecting sensitive information. The guidelines include promptly notifying authorities, des designated a point of contact, sharing relevant information, preserving evidence, following legal and regulatory requirements, being transparent, and respecting confidentiality. The organization assesses subcontractors and customers' incident response capabilities to ensure compliance with established incident response standards, including incident classification, investigation, and reporting. Compliance with the incident response standards is monitored through regular assessments, guidance, and training. Non-compliance may result in termination of contracts and legal action. Adhering to these standards can minimize the impact of incidents and maintain Stark Industries' reputation with external stakeholders. Lastly, we have the cybersecurity infograph. Uh, this infograph 
is a representation of three major uh, organizational cybersecurity awareness training topics. The first being risk implications of internet use. The second being the OWASP top 10. And third, developing and implementing security. These topics are relevant and timely for everything that is happening these days. That concludes this presentation and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening and have a good day.